Welcome to Willard Church of the Nazarene. We're glad you're here. We can't wait to share the service with you. I 
King of heaven, my King forever. You storm the gates of my heart, the veil in between was torn apart. Now you hold the keys to the grave, cause you bring things to life, you roll stones away. All praise to the Lord most high, all praise to the one who saved my life, all praise to Jesus Christ, high King of heaven, my King forever. Thank you. 
shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turned his face toward you and gave you peace. Oh, amen. 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 Oh, amen. Amen. generational curses can go on and on. But that's the same as blessings. God can bless your family for generations and generations. And it can start with our praises, our pure praise unto Him can go on and on and on throughout generations and generations. This morning, I just want you just to praise Him.
with all that you have. The purest praise. And bless your generations and generations and generations. favor be upon you and the thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and the thousand generations and your family and your children and their children be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, if you turn there in your Bibles. This, uh, this is a story of Hannah. I taught this uh, a couple years ago, but I, I've seen this kind of in a new light, and God's revealed some things to me that I want to share with you. But this is a story of a woman that's in deep anguish. There are voices that are speaking into her life and adding to the sorrow that she's experiencing. And there's this awesome moment where she stands up and she responds to the sorrow in the the best possible way that you could. And and I want us to be able to respond like she did. This just isn't just for women. It's geared towards women, but this is for us all. And, and, And parents, this is a message that we have to pass on to our kids teach them about this. I I want us to all be able to respond like she does in these types of seasons that we find ourselves in so often. Seasons of sorrow, seasons of anguish, right? 1 Samuel 1, beginning at verse 3, would you stand in honor of God's word? Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hopni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. 
Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they were finished eating at, and drinking at Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forgive your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Skip down to verse 18. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they rose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord, for him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a light unto our path. It shows us the direction that we should go. Father, help us to honor it. Help us to honor you. Lord, speak through it to our hearts today. May they be soft and malleable. May our eyes and ears be open, Lord. And may we give you all the glory and honor you deserve. We love you and we give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In the first part of this passage, we learn of Hannah's sorrow, right? Each year, this family would travel to Shiloh. That's where the ark is. And they would make a sacrifice before it. This man, Elkanah, he has two wives. Verse 4, whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept her provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. So, one of Elkanah's wives is bearing a lot of children, and one wife can't bear any. The one bearing the children mocks the one who is unable and we're told later in verse 10 that Hannah was in deep anguish, weeping bitterly over this. The, the, the word deep anguish literally means a, a pain of the soul. And when it says that she was weeping bitterly, she's crying out loud. She's wailing out loud. She's experiencing great sorrow. Why? Why is she so unhappy? Well, at this time it was typical, but not condoned by God. Don't mistake that. This is not God's idea, right? That if you married a woman, though, and she could not bear children, that you would take a second wife. And that seems to be what's happened here. She couldn't have kids, so her husband married another woman, and this other woman could. So that points to Hannah as being the problem here, right? The big reason for her sorrow is that she's not living up to the cultural ideal. The cultural ideal for women at this time was to have lots of children. Lots of kids at this time was important for families, and not only families, but for communities and nations as well. The more kids you had, the better off you were economically, right? If you had more kids, you could plant more crops. You could put those kids to work. You could plant bigger fields, right? If you had a trade business, you had more workers for, to send out to do things. Uh, the bigger, the better. The bigger all those things were, the more money that you could bring in. And, and like I said, this not only benefited the individual family, but the community as well. There's more people working. There's more people trading. There's more people who need stuff. 
So, so the, the community was blessed. It was good for it. Second, it was good for your future security, right? The more children you had, the more likely you would have a place to, to live in your old age. They, they didn't have social programs at this time. They didn't have retirement. No, they would depend on their family. So the more family you had, the more security you had. Not, not only for yourself or your family, but for the community as well, right? The, the more kids that all the families had in the community, the bigger you were, the bigger you were. Obviously, the, the more people that you would have that could fight to protect that community, to raise an army for a nation. So this was huge in this time period for families and for communities and for nations. Therefore, one of the best things you could do for you, for your family, for your nation would be to have kids. A woman bearing a lot of kids was a hero. She would be looked up to. Look at what she's contributed, not only to her husband, right, but to her nation and to her community. So that's the cultural ideal in this time period placed on women right and it was pressed on hannah we read year after year her inability and because of that she's a failure in everyone's eyes she has to be thinking what would you be thinking she has to be thinking what did i do to deserve this, to cause this, uh, for, for the Lord to close my womb. She doesn't know the Lord has closed her womb. But she has to be thinking it. What did I do to make God mad? And as a result, she's in great agony. It's, it's kind of interesting because uh, the importance of having family is still relevant today. In the last few years, I don't know if you're seeing this in news more and more, but we're seeing these nations with low birth rates and we're seeing all the problems that are resulting from this, from these countries where they're not having kids or as many kids. And these countries are trying to entice the, their people to, to have families, right? They, they realize that if this continues, they're not going to have enough people to, to support the government, enough people working, and enough people to support all the people, all the older generations retiring. In, in Japan and Norway, if you have a kid, they give you a big stipend every month up until your kids are two or three, and then after that, it's a smaller allowance until they're an adult. In Germany, you pay less taxes. How, how great would that be, right, if you have children? Iceland not only encourages you to have kids, but also for you to be married. And if you are married and have kids, you're going to be and make typically 80% more than, than people that are single. Hungary, Poland, Sweden all have bonuses or allowances to encourage you to have kids. China's one-child policy, they've realized that was a huge mistake. They've gone away from that. They, they let you have two now, but they're still seeing the consequences from that, even though that they've stepped it up. They see that they're not going to have enough people to support this aging population, and they're trying to figure out what to do. But back to this issue of not living up to the cultural ideal in this time period. Every culture tends to put pressure on individuals to live up to whatever that ideal is, right? And every culture has paninas who come up to you and say that you're a failure, that you don't measure up, and they make fun of you, and they make you feel worthless. Our culture, oh, our culture puts so much pressure on women to live up to this impossible physical ideal, right? And because we have this, we, we Photoshop ourselves. We see people are Photoshopped in magazines. We put on the filters with all the image, images. Even in movies, people are digitally edited or there are body doubles, right? We, we've all learned the right way to take the selfie. That's the most flattering, right? Because of this cultural ideal. And where does that lead us? We now have a culture that largely self-harms, Right? Young ladies cut themselves, burn themselves. We have all sorts of eating disorders. And it's, it's not just looks. It's not just women, right? There are money, status, accomplishment, ideals. Not too long ago, there was an ideal that said, man, you, you, you need to go to college, right? You need to have that degree. And if you don't, right, 
You're just kind of lower class. That was the idea. And look where that has gotten us today. Now we cannot find carpenters. Now we cannot find tradesmen to do our work because of this cultural ideal that was placed on people. We'll always have the paninas that say you're ugly, you're untalented, you're stupid, right? We're probably the biggest paninas, though, to ourselves, right? We're, we're hardest on ourselves. We often speak down to ourselves, putting ourselves down, right? Because we think we don't meet this cultural ideal. Every culture has it something that it strives for. And if you don't fit in, you, you get that stigma, right? Maybe you're not the right race. Maybe you're not the, the, the right sex. Maybe you're not the right whatever, right? And, and you're made fun of. You're put down. That, that's what she's experiencing right here. She's being told, you're not valuable, right? You're not contributing to this society you're a waste, you're a burden, and this is the source of her sorrow. But how does she respond? This is a message that we need to teach our kids, right? Notice what she doesn't do. There are two major voices that are speaking into her life at this time. There's, of course, the voice of Penina, uh, her rival who kept taunting her and making fun of her. We know that, reducing her to tears. We, we said that that represents the cultural voice, right? The second voice is that of her husband, though. Verse 8, Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? I mean, I believe this guy meant well, right, with these. It, it may sound good to you. We know he loves her. It tells us that, right? He would give her a double portion. Uh, and in his mind, you know, I think he's trying to do what he can to encourage her. You know, yeah, you don't have children, but you got me, right? You've got my love. Shouldn't that be a consolation to you? But at the, same, at the same time, he's taking a second wife, right? Obviously, she wasn't enough. And he's saying, yeah, I love you in a different way that I love Penina, which is horrible too if you think about it, right? Think about Penina. Maybe she realizes this. Uh, he doesn't love me like he loves Hannah, and maybe that's part of the reason that she's taunting her. You know, how would this be any consolation? The fact that is in this account that she doesn't answer either voice tells us something. She doesn't respond to either voice that's speaking to her, and it's meant to show us something, right? Uh, understand this. Both voices say, here's how you can be happy. And then the culture says you have to depend on having children. That's how you can be happy. Her husband's voice says you have to depend on my, my uh, love to be happy. She doesn't respond to either. And that tells us that she's not buying into either. Right? That tells us that we can, we can also build our lives on, we don't have to also build our lives on a cultural ideal or on our spouse's affection, which both are huge for women, especially today for us, right? Oftentimes, ladies, you, you build your life on one of those two things. Having kids or meeting the cultural ideal or having the affection of, of that person in your life. Uh, there was this woman who had lived a, a horrible life because she had been addicted to male affection. And she so needed that that she would, she would love these men, and that meant she would get into abusive relationships. She would stay in those relationships when she should have gotten out. She ended up finding Christ, though, and it changed her life. She was going to a therapist, and that therapist said to her, you've depended all your life on, for, uh, for men, for your self-image, uh, on male affection and what men think of you, and, and that's not good. What you really need to do is go get a career, Go get a, a really good job, and then you're going to feel better about yourself because you're going to be a career person. And this woman recognized, though, that it was horrible advice. She said uh, she had always been enslaved to men. Why would she enslave herself then to a career, right? She would get upset depending on whether or not a man would, would love her 
And it was interesting because those men all got upset on the types of jobs that they had. She saw the, the cycle that she was in, and she saw the cycle that they were in, and she didn't want to trade that, right? She knew that if she turned to a career for her identity, she'd just become enslaved to that instead of a man. And she recognized as a follower of Christ that she didn't want to be enslaved to either. That's why she said she became a Christian. So Hannah doesn't trade being a slave to the culture by becoming a slave to her husband's affection. She ignores that, and, and we need to ignore also those voices that speak into our lives. That's the first thing Hannah does. Then the second thing she does is the most decisive and radical thing she could possibly do. It's seen in verse 9. It says, Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Voices coming at her, and Hannah stands up. Now, when you and I read this, uh, we have to look past that this is something that just actually describes literally what was happening. It, it's actually an, an idiom. You know, it's words that when placed together have a, a different meaning than the literal thing. An example we would use today is that uh, she saw the light. That doesn't mean you literally saw the light. It means that she had some kind of revelation. That's what an idiom is. Uh, if we said a, a, a guy put his foot down, right, that doesn't literally mean he put his foot down. It means that he, he put a rule in place and he expected people to follow it. When Hannah stood up, this means that she took charge. She decided to take action. No more is she just going to let life happen and have these voices coming at her. She's going to do something radical. What was the radical thing she did? Verse 10. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give me a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of my life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Now what's going on here, right? What's so decisive about this? At, at, at first glance, it, it looks like she's actually bargaining with God. It sounds like she's saying, oh, oh, I, I figured out a way to get God to move, to open up my womb, right, and to get a son out of this, you know, since God won't seem to give me one. I, I'll promise, I'll promise to put this son into ministry, and then maybe, maybe God will agree to it and give me what I'm asking. This is, this is often how we pray. This is often how we do it, right? We try and make that bargain to appeal to him and get him to move or get him to do what we're asking him to do. If you just give me a million dollars, this is a prayer I've prayed, uh, I'll tithe on it, right? Oh, whoopie do. That's not happening here, though. If she was making a bargain, then this next thing wouldn't have happened. Verse 18, she says, May your servant find favor in your eyes, then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Do you see it? Do you see what happens here? If she would have been bargaining, this is the order of what would have happened, right? We would have prayer, then pregnancy, then peace. That's how bargains work. Prayer, answer the prayer, then peace. It would have happened in that order. Say, say, for example, you're in a really tough time and you pray out like, Lord, just save me from this, right? Do you get peace after you pray or do you get peace after you come out of this thing that you're in, if you're able to come out of it? That's, that's typically what we're doing and how we're praying. That's not her though, right? Most people, when they pray, they don't experience peace after the prayer because they're, they're doing this bargaining with God. And they have to get what they're asking for in order to be happy. But not Hannah, right? And this is, what, this is how every follower of Christ needs to pray and needs to realize and needs to get to a place where they're at, right? It needs to be in this order, all right? It was bargaining is, is, is prayer, answer to prayer, peace. Followers of Christ, it's prayer, peace, period. That's where it needs to be regardless of answer to prayer. That's where we need to get to. That's where Hannah was, right? That's how she prayed. 
She made her request. She poured everything out to God, and she left the outcome in his hands. Whether I get pregnant, whether I get this job, whether or not I make more money, I'm okay with it. I'm going to trust you, right? That, that's putting your trust fully in God. And that's the best place to be because that's the place where you will find peace. If you don't, then it's all going to be what happens with your circumstances. But you can be beyond that. You can find peace beyond that. that that's huge, and we have to get this, right? If you've heard a part of my testimony, I hit an Amish buggy when I was going to work one day. And, and, and the, the people were thrown out of it. One kid was laying on the ground going into convulsions. I thought he was going to die. And they life lighted him away. And, and that night I'm thinking and I'm praying and I am in anguish and I'm worried about what's going to happen, right? And I'm like, I'm probably going to end up in jail. I don't know, involuntary manslaughter. I don't know if that's a real thing that you would go to jail for. But that's what I'm thinking at the time. And God made me aware Whatever happens, I'll be with you. And so I was praying that this kid would live, but in my heart, I determined that no matter what, I was going to trust him with the outcome because I knew if I went to jail, he'd be with me and there'd be a reason and there'd be a purpose behind it. That's where we need to get behind in our prayer. Prayer, then peace, right? Hannah got up, went and literally cried out to God, spilled it all, spilled all of her pain, all of her anguish, right, all there right before God. And when she was done, she experienced the peace of God. We know that because her face was no longer downcast, right? And she was able to eat. You can't eat when you're, when you're in agony, when you're worrying about stuff. It's, it's really hard to do. But when you're able to leave it in God's hand and truly trust him for it, you can find that peace. Whether or not he would do it, it was up to him. She's at peace before getting the answer to the prayer that she wanted. This is usually not how we pray, though. This is usually not how we approach God. We keep praying and praying and praying and praying until we get that thing that we want. But maybe it's not his will. We've got to trust it to his will and just lay it down before him right? We, we see even more of this when we look at her vow. This isn't just about putting her son in ministry, right? Because she says at the end of verse 11, I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. What's she talking about there? Well, you have to understand a system back then, right? Elkanah was actually a Levite living as an Ephraimite. Levites were one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were the priests and the people who, who ministered and did everything in the tabernacle and took care of all the other 11 tribes of Israel when it came to worship and serving God. The other 11 tribes, they could actually own property, own their own land. They had their own wealth. They had inheritance, right? They could go into business and, and farm, but the Levites couldn't do any of that. They were dependent on the rest. They weren't given any land as their own. They had no assets. They, they depended on offerings, right? And the, the vow that she makes for, his, for her son is the vow of a Nazarite. A Nazarite was like a voluntary Levite, usually only for a time. But she says for the rest of his life. A Nazarite was given to Levitical-type work to live in the, temper, in the tabernacle and to help the priests and do the work of the Lord, right? And the sign that you committed to this was you wouldn't shave your head and you wouldn't drink any alcohol. And when you see this, it makes even more sense what Hannah is doing here. Why did women want children back then? We said all the things. She, she wanted children to fit in. Women would go to the marketplace and they'd bring their kids with them and their kids would play with each other and they'd talk about their kids and show off things and tell stories. This vow meant she'd still be living a life without that if it happened. If he's a, a Nazarite, he's going to be staying at the temple there. So she, she wouldn't be able to fit in. Another reason why you'd have a son is because you'd, you'd want them to grow up and learn to trade Take down the family business, inherit the land, provide for you. But if your son's a Nazarite, 
He's not going to be able to do that. He's not taking on the family business. He's not going to be owning any land. There's no future security for her. A third reason why you'd want to have a son is to fill your life with the richness, richness of literal hugs and kisses, right? The emotional richness, richness of having a child come up to you and just give you a hug and tell you that they love you with big smiles, and you'd have that person to put your arm around, right? But if your son is a Nazarite and going to live in the temple away from you, he's not living with you. You're not getting that. Maybe you see him once a year. This would be the worst bargain in the history of mankind if she was doing that because she's not gaining anything. So what's she doing here? This is huge. Hannah was asking for a son, but not for her own purposes. She was asking for a son for God's purposes. Big difference, right? We, we see a glimpse in that and how she identifies herself. She refers to herself as, a, as God's servant. So she asks for a son for God's purposes, not hers. That's the key. And that's another thing that we need to learn when we approach God in prayer. If a, if a person vowed, God, if you give me a brand new car, right, or lots of money, or a really good job, and then I promise I will follow you forever, who's all that stuff really for? It's for us, right? It's aimed at us. That, it, it's for that person that has nothing to do with God. And God knows that if he would give us those things, they'd just lead our hearts away from him. So why would he do that? Why would he answer that prayer? We, we try to make these things about God, right? Like I said, you know, if you give me that million dollars, I'll tithe. You know, we, we try to bargain with him. We try to pretend that it's really about him and all the good that we're going to do. But he sees through our true intentions. He sees our motivation. Don't think that you can fool him. Let's not kid ourselves with our prayers, right? What if, though, we prayed differently? What if we made it all about him? Lord, will you, will you give your servant a reliable car so that I can go serve in this ministry or that ministry in this other town, right? That's a prayer focused in on him and his purposes. Lord, I would love a spouse, but give me a spouse that I can serve you together with, right? That's a prayer. What are you praying for? And who is it really for? If you're praying for things, thinking that those things or those people, when they're put into your life, are going to give you peace and contentment, they never will. The only one that can is Jesus Christ. Don't kid yourself. You know how else you know if you're praying right or wrong? Or if you're coming at it from the right place? It's how you react to the no's. If you pray for something and he doesn't answer it the way you want, right? If it doesn't go your way and it makes you angry or it makes you miserable, you're praying from the wrong place. If that's the case, you're, you're finding your purpose in those things. Those are idols. People can be idols. Things can be idols, right? But if you find your purpose in him, then it doesn't matter if he gives you that money that car, that job, that person, right? You're going to have him regardless. And that's where you find peace. That's where you find purpose, right? That's the place that we all need to get to. Here, here's the crazy thing, though. God is sneaky. Sneaky. Sneaky good, right? Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, this is, this is a verse you need to memorize. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, right? And all these things will be given to you as well. You need to know that. That's exactly what Hannah was doing in this situation in her prayer, right? Seeking a child, but for his purposes, his kingdom. And what a child Samuel turned out to be, right? A great prophet of God one of the most important figures in our history, in Christianity and Jewish history, the last judge to leave the people of Israel for four decades, and he would be the one to anoint King David. But seek first his kingdom 
and his righteousness. And in all these things, and all these things will be given to you as well. That's an amazing promise. Right? Because Hannah looked to his kingdom, looked at herself as his servant. And what was her reward? God answered her prayer so far beyond what she asked for, right? He gave her the desires of her heart, not just with Samuel, right? 1 Samuel 2.21, And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Here's the key. If you're praying and you're seeking your kingdom, that's a prayer he won't answer. Because in the end, it will just take you away from him. They'll just be idols. But if you seek his kingdom and his righteousness, he will give you those other things. Why? Because when you are seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, when you're doing that, you're finally able to handle those other things in the right way, in the best way, for the right purposes. You're finally in the right position to receive those things. Would you stand with me? Ladies, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? You seek after that other stuff, it's not going to last. It's going to leave you empty in the end. It's going to turn to dust, right? Seek his kingdom above everything else and he'll give you the desires of your heart. What do you desire? Right? What do you, what do you desire? You've got to have the right heart that can handle that. And he's not going to give you that before you're ready. It would just destroy you. Just like you won't give your kids a bunch of, bunch of candy, maybe a little bit, you know. But you don't want to hurt them. God is a loving father, a bridegroom that wants the best for you. He's got something you can't even imagine. You can't even fathom. But you got to seek him first. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, I, I, I know I've mentioned ladies, but I'm speaking to us all, including myself. Father, would you help us to seek your kingdom first? It, it's, it's not a trick. It's not a... It's not a way to, to, to make us just focused on you and, and for your benefit. It's for our benefit. Lord, would you open up that truth to us? Lord, would you enable us to make a vow today in all seriousness with the understanding of how it, important it is to, to keep vows? Would you help us to make that vow today to seek you to the best of our ability? to seek your kingdom, to seek your face, Lord, by turning to your word, by being in prayer, by, by coming to church, by being the church, Lord. And would you bless those people that do that? Father, again, we thank you for moms. We give you all praise and honor for them, Lord. Let us as children with moms that are still around be a blessing to our moms today and every day, Lord. Father, thank you for what the praise team spoke to us, Lord. Help us to realize that the choices that we make, the priorities that we make today, echo through eternity. And we are either choosing a life of bondage for our kids and future generations or a life of beautiful freedom. Lord, remind us of that. Lord, we give you all praise. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I think we got an announcement if we're ready. All right. Your new church board members, and man, this was close. One point between third and fourth. So we voted for three. Nancy Resendez, Debbie Smith, and Carol Tussing. Sunday School Board, another close. Barb Ball, Aaron Kennard, and Linda Prater. 
Sunday school and discipleship ministry, super, super yes. Missions International, super yes. Youth and teens, super yes. And delegates to the district assembly, that was also a yes as well. Can we, can we get those people to come up here who are, who are the new board positions and new leadership positions so that we can lay hands on you and pray for you right now? And can you give them a round of applause while they come? I don't know about you, but I had a, tr- I had a hard time voting for people and, uh, because we just had so many good options. And I'm going to tell you, like if you weren't even on this list, please don't take that personally because we had like double this list when we were looking at people that we wanted in these positions. And um, we just thought, what would be best for you and what would be best for the church? And we tried to let God lead us. So please, if you wanted to serve on one of these boards or something like that, please know it wasn't anything. You know, George, you were one. And we said, we know what you're going through, right? And we want you to be able to focus in on that because we love you and care about you. But um, would you kneel down if you're able? Yeah. Uh, Rest of the board, Anybody else in leadership, will you come up and just put your hands behind them and uh, pray for them? Uh, you two should be kneeling. You, you're technically, I know, returning, but you're not new. But yeah, we still want to pray for you. All right. All right. All right, not going to listen. All right. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for these new leaders of our church. Lord, we give you all honor and praise. Father, I pray that you would guide them. I pray that they would not make decisions out of human wisdom, but make decisions focused in on what you call them to do. May they speak truth, even if they disagree with me, especially if they disagree with me or other board members. Would you grant us unity, though? Would you help us to remember at the end of the day, it, it's, not about, it's not about us. It's only about you, Lord. Thank you for these people, Lord. Thank you for their servant's heart. Lord, I thank you for this church and all the things that everyone does. Father, I know that there are a lot of servants in here, a lot of people with servant's hearts, and I pray that they would know how much I appreciate them, how much their church appreciates them, but but what a blessing they are to even you, Lord. We love you and we give you praise. In your name we pray, amen.